thank you everybody for coming and uh, I'm Zheng Zeyu, uh, Chief Data Scientist at TechCloud. And today, um, my colleague and I will give a talk about how to run TensorFlow on Kubernetes with GPU enabled. And we'll also introduce you guys about you know, the experience we have gained from running the distributed TensorFlow and also um, about some, something about TensorFlow. So here's the agenda for today. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce you about uh, you know, some basic ideas about TensorFlow. What is TensorFlow and how it's related to deep learning and artificial intelligence kind of thing. And then I would like to introduce about you know, how to start a distributed TensorFlow and uh, mostly on the environmental you know, machines. Um, then I would like to introduce a little bit about how to start you know, um, distributed TensorFlow with Kubernetes. Uh, then I would like to introduce my colleague uh, Hui Zhi, Zhao Hui Zhi to introduce about how to you know, um, enable GPU on Kubernetes, uh, who was the author of the you know, uh, GitHub pull request for enabling GPU. And after that, I would like to um, show about how to you know, enable the TensorFlow with um, you know, GPU enabled on Kubernetes, and also why, um, like, you know, what's the benefit of it, and how do I do that? Um, and finally, I would like to introduce you about the product we're building, and we are going to announce the first version of the public clouds about you know, distributed TensorFlow, and it's named as TensorFlow as a Service. So, First of all, I would like to introduce a little bit about uh, deep learning, and I, I think most of you should be heard about the, you know, the deep learning st uh, stuff. And I think the first time that most of the public uh, heard about deep learning and something like artificial intelligence are uh, starting from the AlphaGo project, so which is a, a Go player and who win, who win uh, the. Li I don't know how to translate her, his name, but uh, he's actually a world champion Go player uh, in Korean. So at, um, and after that, AlphaGo um, also went like 60 top players in Go game. And that makes public uh, most uh, aware of the you know, new technologies coming and which is named, named Deep Learning. So, except from the you know some fancy game game, uh, deep learning has already been applied to a lot of stuff. Like on the other side, I show the Google Car project, uh, which is you know starts from like early and uh, 2009, something like that, and it has already been mm, tested for like 200,000 miles, kind of. Um, so, which is um, very long distance actually, and doesn't have much problem of like road crash. Doesn't uh, nobody injured in the actually nobody died in the in accident. So which is a you know great achieve, but uh, this achieve cannot be you know it cannot be achieved without a new technology like deep learning. So and this line shows a um, trend in Google search about the term of deep learning. And you can see from the, the graph that starting from 2012, it's growing exponentially, and um, so it's draws more attention from year to year. And you can see it's from the, the turning point is 2012, and starting from that up to 2016, it's become the you know uh, most well known actually uh, terms of the technology. So why the turning points come from 2012? and what happened in 2012. So I will just give, uh, show you a very mm, simple example, um, you know, the, the most known example, and which is, uh, you know, the most, most of deep learning ap applications has al uh, already been started. So the, this is a picture from uh, ImageNet, which is uh, uh, image recognition data set um, organized by the chief data scientist at Google, which is a previous professor at Stanford University. Uh, whose name is uh, Li Feifei. And so she organized, um, she just gathered a lot, like, you know, uh, almost, say, 10, well, let, let's say, one bi 10 billion, kind of, uh, more than 10 billion pictures from the different sources and labeled them from Mechanical Turk. 
and having some picture like this, organized in a well, um, you know, well organized form in, in the WordNet. So mostly, it's trying to capture the idea about you know uh, what you know what's showing on a picture. Like you know, in, in this picture, we saw some chairs and we saw a dog and the person in the in the picture. So the the purpose for the data set is to you know let the machine learn the how to recognize the picture. And which seems a very easy, you know, task for a person, but it's actually a very different task for, you know, computer because in a, in a, in a version of a, you know, in a computer you just saw numbers, right? You don't actually have sense and have the version, so it's hard to actually let a computer to learn about what is what. So then, what uh, happens in 2012 is that. Um, deep learning technology totally changed the story in image recognition uh, area. So in this graph, I showed the accuracy of the algorithms uh, before the deep learning and after deep learning. You can see there's a huge jump in the, in the error rate. So it's, um, before deep learning has been applied, the error rate is about like 25%. And after that, it's, you know, Starting from 16 and down to, for now, it's about just about 3%. And it's much better than what we do in a human. Like, because, you know, there are one, in, in that data set, we have about 1,000 different categories. And some people, like, you know, we have very similar animals. <laughs> and even people cannot recognize it, you know, 100% sure. So that's what happened because of the, you know, uh, technology of the deep learning. and. Uh, image recognition is just the beginning of the, you know, booming area of the, like, deep learning. Deep learning has already been applied to, like, text and translation and search recommendation. All those areas has, has been changed by deep learning. So it's a very, um, you know, um, say, uh, so, so this technology is, is fascinating. So. Uh, how can we leverage the power of deep learning to our, you know, daily product or to our, you know, real, um, real, um, say, everyday use? So, we, for, first of all, we need to have a tool. Like, you know, this, this talk te technology is very great, but without a tool, you cannot apply the technology to, your, to a real system, right? So, there are lots of um, deep learning tools. So. In, in this slide, I just uh, give you some idea about uh, you know most of famous open source uh, op deep learning toolkit. So they just list a few, and there are more. But from the graph, we can see that the TensorFlow attract most of the attention in the, in the community, right? So the green bar shows the TensorFlow, and the number of mm, stars, number of folks, and number of issues and pull requests. So the, the first two graphs shows that, you know, how popular the toolkit is. Because more folks, more stars means that more attention from the public. But more issues and pull requests means more people are actually using them. So this is one reason why we, we would like to introduce, you know, TensorFlow as a toolkit to implement the deep learning algorithms. And another reason for that is, uh, you know, it, it has been already applied, uh, used by a lot of big names like Google, Uber, uh, Twitter, DeepMind, DeepMind is actually um, a part of Google right now, and also some, you know, companies in China. So that's the reason why I would recommend, you know, TensorFlow as a toolkit to implement deep learning algorithms. Then the rest of the talk would be focused on, you know, how can we better run the toolkits, uh, and how can we better leverage the computing power of the deep learning. As you know, deep learning is not a new name, right? It has been around for, um, it has been proposed for like 60 years already. But why now uh, we can, you know, the, the neural network or deep learning technologies comes again? Um, mostly it's because of the, you know, big data and uh, computation um, energy. So. We have more computation resource and we have more data, um, which makes uh, you know, deep learning a uh, better algorithm than some traditional machine learning algorithms. So uh, seeing that, we need to actually leverage more computation resource. And how do we do that? Uh, this is 
um, the focus of the rest of the my talk. So and uh, display in TensorFlow on one server is actually very easy. And you just need to pipe install TensorFlow and it will install the latest version of TensorFlow. And you can see that um, um, you know, after you install GPU on your ARM machine, it's very easy for TensorFlow to leverage the power of GPU. You just need to install the GPU version of the TensorFlow and it's all there. You can just install it on your ARM laptop or your ARM server and it's there. But um, one TensorFlow, you know, the single, I mean, the TensorFlow on just one server just can leverage the resource in a server. And no matter how strong the server is, it's limited in, res in computational resource, right? Um, here is the result. So if you'd like to train the you know, deep learning algorithm on the ImageNet data set I just mentioned, it will take about half a year to achieve the accuracy about uh, 68. So even to achieve the similar accuracy with the traditional you know, machine learning algorithm, it takes a half a year. So that means you need to leverage more computation resource in order to you know, have a better result or have a better result in a reasonable amount of time. So that's why we would like to introduce uh, distributed TensorFlow. So TensorFlow actually support uh, distribution starting from 0 0.8 version, which released on uh, like, uh, late April last year. And the high level architecture looks like this. So basically it's, uh, it has some parameter servers and some, some workers, right? So per, um, parameter servers uh, just uh, stores the parameter in the, in the you know, deep learning algorithm and the worker does the calculation work. So most heavy calculation stuff happens in a worker and the parameter server just um, holds the parameters. So it's just, that doesn't take a lot of computational resource. And there are a lot of you know, network communication between workers and parameter server. You can see each worker communicates to all parameter servers, so it's a kind of fully connected graph. So that, that may have some problem in the you know, networking bandwidth, and I will talk about that later. And so distributed TensorFlow also can leverage the GPU. So here is the architecture about you know, how to leverage the GPUs because parameter server doesn't do the heavy calculation work. So we don't actually need the GPU to attach to this uh, parameter server. But for each of the worker, we can attach one or multiple GPUs for each worker. And mm, that's, uh, you know, from, from, the, from pure cluster point of view, let, mm, let, let's uh, distribute your TensorFlow, and it's all supported by the original TensorFlow. Then why we like to you know, uh, introduce how to run TensorFlow on Kubernetes? What does Kubernetes do? And so that's uh, what I will introduce. So first, mm, the you know, tensor, distributed TensorFlow doesn't have a management kind of mm, uh, stuff. So basically, we, this is all we Need it, you know what we need to um, rob robotics, uh, robustly uh, run a distributed TensorFlow. Like you know, you if you run the distributed TensorFlow in your in your own machine or in your own server, then you need to you know, log on to every server and start a job, and also you need to monitoring the different servers on your arm, and also some management kind of thing. It's also you know it's not supported by original TensorFlow. So that's why we need uh, mm, Kubernetes to host the TensorFlow. So how, how do we do that? Uh, without GPU, we can actually leverage uh, you know, different, different you know, strategies for, for running a distributed TensorFlow. From here, you can see that uh, we run the parameter server as a Kubernetes deployment and run the uh, worker as a port. So basically, it's, uh, um, so it has different different you know, strategies to start. Why do we do that? So for the um, parameter server, actually it's, it's, quite, it's, it's not so complicated to start. And also it's an uh, ever, um, ever running job in TensorFlow. So we try to use uh, deployment to start a TensorFlow. But for, for the worker, it's actually a best job. And so we, we use the best job to start uh, mm, TensorFlow worker and it will you know, automatically creates after its, um, the iteration ends for the, for the training part. And so then we, we can 
distribute different, you know, we can, we can either uh, assign the, you know, TensorFlow worker to the same server or we can assign it to different uh, servers. So the observation is that if you assign it to, um, mm, so TensorFlow can actually leverage all the resources in a, in a machine. So if you, if you run it in a, in a single machine, almost. Um, but uh, so in that case, if you run multiple worker on the same, same machine, the speed, you know, the acceleration rate will not be so great. So you, you need to assign the worker into, into different uh, servers. And also, you know, for the for PS and for Pamela server and worker, you, you better assign, you know, PS close to, to workers because there are communication between workers and Pamela servers. So that's how we can run uh, TensorFlow, distributed TensorFlow on uh, Kubernetes. But uh, what if we need to you know, uh, leverage GPU power? So we need to actually um, make sure that the Kubernetes cluster can, can you know, manage the GPU resource. And uh, the, then the, this part, uh, I would like to introduce my colleague uh, Zhao Huizhi to introduce how to enable GPU on Kubernetes. Okay, um, I would like to uh, introduce that how I enable GPU on Kubernetes, in Kubernetes and why we need a GPU. I think GPU can benefit lots of applications, uh, especially for TensorFlow, um, and, and also it can benefit lots of other applications. So GPU is very important. And to enable that, I think I started to enable the GPU when I was working in HP and the first PR I made it is also from there. Uh, to enable GPU, I think that we need to have uh, different levels. Like first of all, we need to uh, make the C group can support the GPU. Uh, also, we need to the container uh, uh, container manager like Docker or Rocket. Uh, can support the GPU, and uh, then we will think about the container orchestration environment like Kubernetes or Mesos or other things. And uh, uh, since we are using the Kubernetes and uh, Docker, so I would like to introduce how we enable the GPU in Docker and uh, Kubernetes. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to uh, see that uh, the device mapping in Docker, Docker uh, used uh, the GPU as a device, just use that, that device, is already been supported. And uh, then we need to uh, <coughs> give the GPU discovery capability in Kubernetes because the, we may have, uh, in container orchestration environment, we may have like 1,000 servers, and we don't know which server have GPUs, and we need to let the Kubernetes discover GPU by itself, not uh, we configure them one by one server. And then we need to have the assignment and free GPUs in Kubernetes. Once we have a container run on, run on a machine that we need to allow, assign a GPU to a container, and when the container is died or killed, we need to free the GPU so the GPU can be used by other containers. And the last one is scheduled GPU resource in Kubernetes scheduler. The Kubernetes scheduler need to know how many GPUs on each machine. Also, it need to can have the capability to assign multiple GPUs to one container. Okay, let's go through them one by one. Uh, to, uh, fortunately, um, when I check the Docker, it already can support the device command. The device command can treat the Avila Docker as a device um, the device is one of the uh, C group and namespace so device type. Uh, we already have the CPU memory and uh, like a block I.O. device or networking. But uh, for other devices, and we need to treat them as device. And uh, if we want to uh, add the GPUs to container, we need to add an entire GPU to container, not just like the networking, like maybe or the CPU, like 20% of the uh, CPU we can assign to a container, but we can't do that for GPU. Uh, in this case, um, I 
attached two, can, two GPUs to one container, uh, this is just a command to use the dash dash command. And uh, we must uh, ensure that the NVIDIA control and the NVIDIA UVM also be attached to the container. Um, otherwise, it cannot be used. Uh, once we uh, run this uh, command, we can check the uh, NVIDIA device inside the container, like to check well like check whether the NVIDIA 0 or NVIDIA 1 is already under the uh, dev, dev folder. Also, we can use the docker inspect command to check the device mapping. Uh, you can see that it has the paths on host and the paths in container, also the permissions. This is uh, how we uh, assign con <coughs> GPUs to container on Docker. After that, we need to uh, make the, give the Kubernetes have the discovery capability of GPUs. Uh, we can see uh, as in this picture that we need to attach the NVIDIA CTL and uh, NVIDIA UVM to the container, whatever GPU device you want to uh, attach to the container. I mean only the NVIDIA GPUs. So far we only use the NVIDIA GPUs. And on the OS, we need to ensure that the uh, CODA has already been installed and the NVIDIA driver is also installed as well. And uh, we can check the use, like use the NVIDIA SMI, the command, we can check whether it's uh, installed uh, correctly. On this machine, uh, we can have, we have like uh, four GPUs and it uh, will show like this, we have NVIDIA 0 to NVIDIA 4 and also we have the NVIDIA control and the NVIDIA UVM. Um, also, we need to decide which kind of uh, uh, information that we need, like the CODA version or the just the GPU pass or some like family names, because for TensorFlow, it, uh, if we use different kind of GPUs, it may have a lower performance than the same type. So we need to, so it's better we can have the family name also, driver name is very important, but so far it only supports the GPU uh, device, like we can have the NVIDIA 0 or NVIDIA 1, we don't have other information, because regarding the other informations, we need to use the NVIDIA management library, it's called NVML, but so far it doesn't support that yet, and we are working on that. The next one is uh, how to assign and free GPUs in Kubernetes. In this picture, uh, we can see that we assign two, uh, two GPUs uh, for one container and uh, the third GPUs for one container and fourth GPUs for one container. Uh, Kubernetes uh, need to management the GPU information, uh, especially like the GPU path is very important and for other information, if we can support it uh, in the future, it also will be in the Kubernetes. But uh, actually, uh, in Kubernetes, it's just a temporary version uh, for now. We will move that to the C advisor. It will be better. And we can see the scheduled GPU resource uh, in the Kubernetes scheduler. Uh, we treat the immediate GPU resource as the uh, CPUs and uh, memories. We put it here. So, uh, once uh, you write uh, like a YAML file that it uh, contains that the GPU uh, resource that you need, it will can uh, allocate like multiple GPUs uh, for one container. <coughs> but so far, it's only dedicated uh, GPUs because that we use GPUs like as uh, in the device group, not as implemented in the kernel level like the CPU, memory, block device, or network. Okay. And here is about what we should do next. Um, for the first one is that we need to support it, uh, the CRI. And so far it only supports Docker because we use, uh, in, in my scenarios, and uh, we only use Docker, but the CRI is already in the 1.6 and we will uh, let the NVIDIA GPU could support the CRI in the next version. 
And like I said, the NVML is very important because we want the family name and the driver version and uh, maybe the slot information is also needed. But if we want that, we need to install the, we need to load the NVML library. That first of all, uh, we need to support the GPU discovery and uh, GPU assignment. Also, the like uh, multiple GPU in one container is what we need right now. We need to do that uh, one step by one step. And that's why it's a GPU driver volume support because the GPU driver have compatible issues if we use a higher version. And we need to uh, make different volume uh, for the different container. So <coughs> we need to, like we need to know the family name and the coda version so we can just mount the volume automatically uh, we don't need to uh, write it in the YAML file. Uh, that will be great if we have the GPU driver volume mount, but uh, we need to enable the NVML library first. And the last one is uh, NICO support. This is about uh, the uh, collaborative uh, communication, like maybe on one machine that uh, <coughs> we have lots of GPUs, and GPUs can uh, either uh, can communicate like uh, very fast and have lots of data to communicate. It will be the bottleneck when we run the TensorFlow. And if we support the NICO, I think that we can resolve that problems. But we need to do those things uh, one by one. And uh, <coughs> it have a lot of things to do, and we have a list for that. Um, I think um, it will, it's very welcome that if you can join us to enable the GPUs. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so actually that, that's a, a part of the you know, um, problems that we encounter about how to you know, build a um, sustainable TensorFlow cluster on top of Kubernetes. So the, one of the most important problems is how to actually you know, enable the GPUs in the Kubernetes cluster. After we enable the you know, GPU, inside the Kubernetes cluster. The Kubernetes cluster knows that, okay, some of the server has GPU, some doesn't. And after we you know, uh, schedule the TensorFlow worker, it will actually search for the you know, GPU, which search for the server, which can actually, you know, actually have a GPU support. So by that way, we, we can um, assign the workers to the server, which have GPU resource, and assign the you know, TF um, parameter server to the you know, to a worker that may not have a GPU uh, device. So there are multiple ways that we can we can distribute the tensor. I mean, distribute the GPU resource. Uh, one way is that we can actually um, use uh, as many as GPUs it has in a server in a Docker, and in that way, it's more denser, and sometimes it may achieve better acceleration rate. Um, but the problem is that you know the user needs to. Uh, you know, be aware of the number of GPUs it has, um, and it need to admit, you know um, manually set which operation should be you know allocated to which GPU in each worker. If you if different worker have different you know number of GPUs, then it will be a problem to you know to start a cluster. Um, uh, so in that case, we uh, choose not to support multiple GPUs in a worker. Uh, at this time, but we will work on that uh, in the you know, you know, you know, future. Uh, for now, our solution is that for each worker, we only support at most one GPU. And then we can, you know, if you have multiple GPUs in a, in a server that like shows up in the left, left side, um, you can actually allocate more than one worker into that server. So that's the solution uh, in, in our system right now. And um, during the time that we built uh, distributed TensorFlow, uh, we actually encountered some, some problems, and uh, th there are some solutions, and there are some open discussion, I would say. So the first, first one is the network is actually the worst bottleneck. Um, so in the TensorFlow official you know, website, it announced that it will almost accelerate linearly with the number of GPUs uh, it uses. But in our experiments, we find that the linearity is, is not so easy to achieve. 
the most, the hardest problem is the you know network. Uh, why we say that? Because two different um, uh, tasks actually needs the network. One is the parameter server uh, needs the network to communicate with workers to tra mm, translate. Uh, I mean. And to to commun communicate on the you know parameter server, uh, not parameter server, but pa parameters in the model. And another one is worker needs to consume the network to load data. So both of the you know parameter server and worker needs a high amount of network resource. So in that case, uh, it will you know the network is easily get you know um, consumed up and it's become the bottleneck of the. Uh, acceleration. So some mm, some of the strategies that we uh, tried is first of all you can actually you know have a uh, you know better network network strategy. That's 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 you can, you know that is what you can choose always. And besides besides that, we try to actually mm, mm, adjust the number of parameter server you would you would um, in the TensorFlow cluster and also. In our our experiment, we saw that if you increase the number of you know batches in the TensorFlow training job, it will also ease the problem of you know getting too much uh, communication between parameter worker, uh, parameter server and workers. So, and there are definitely some more strategy that you can uh, try, like you know gRPC have some configuration that you can try different. Um, you know, um, strategies of the, um, mm, like, mm, you know, to, to better, ha have a better communication rate, but um, that we haven't tried yet. So uh, that we have already tried, and some of them worked to, you know, in our experiment, we saw that six GPUs can achieve about uh, 3.5 times acceleration than one GPU. So, and another, Thing that we we also try is that uh, we try different GPUs like uh, 1080 and K80. Uh, they are different, uh, very different kind of GPUs. Uh, K80 is actually for server and it's it's running very smoothly and also it have lower risk of burning out. And but the problem is that if you are more care about uh, speed, then 1080 is you know more is what you need. Actually, it's it's faster than the speed of K80 and it's much cheaper. So there's some some problem and some you know experience we learned from from our mm, previous uh, experience. And but uh, the following I would like to introduce about our product uh, that is TensorFlow as a service. So what what's that and what we do in the in the, in the system? So basically we have. Um, so, so mostly it's in Chinese right now, but it will get uh, translated into English in something around uh, like maybe late May or early June, something like that. So you can just look at the interface. Mostly it's just you can start start the TensorFlow training, and we have a higher level API of TensorFlow, which looks like TFNER, but it's a little bit different. And also we handles distribution automatically, and we handles all the monitoring, all the you know resource management and stuff like that in the in, in our system. So here is a, a very simple you know um, um, different. I, I mean the the fun function um, comparison between the original distributed TensorFlow and our product TensorFlow as a service. So in sum, is that if you know the uh, Hadoop system, which composed of uh, HDFS uh, file system and uh, YARN scheduling system and the uh, MapReduce computational framework. So why Hadoop could be so popular is because it's all self-contained. And you can actually deploy a TensorFlow without a uh, lot of tricks, um, you know, the system stuff. You can just leverage it. And you can put your data on the HDFS and you can use a MapReduce computational framework to do your calculation. But TensorFlow only supports, uh, you know, calculation framework. So it, it supports distributed uh, distribution and it has the mode of, you know, distribution. But what it uh, leak is that mm, it leaks of the, you know, uh, resource management. Like we need to have a Kubernetes cluster to allocate, 
you know, the jobs and monitoring the resource uh, it used by TensorFlow cluster. And also it needs, uh, you know, like what, what happens um, if it, you know, some error happened in the training process. You need to restart the training, training process and also you need to see if, whether it's because of your algorithm or your data or your, you know, your platform. So in that case, our, our system will notify you, you know, whether it's because of your, your algorithm or it's because of the platform. So that's what we did. And also for higher level uh, abstraction that, you know, for deep learning model, you will not actually just train once. You will try different uh, layers. You will try different you know, structure of the you know, uh, neural network. You will try different so, uh, hyperparameter, like you know, number of nodes, like your know, learning rate, number of batch, I mean, number of training steps, stuff like that. So mostly you will, you, you would you know, train multiple, um, you, you would run multiple TensorFlow, distributed TensorFlow jobs. Uh, so, yeah, so that's the difference between the original TensorFlow and our TensorFlow as a service. So there are some, some interface, because of the time is limited, I just want to just very briefly show the interface and stuff like that. So we have a storage, which mostly look like, uh, you know, local, local storage. And also we, we monitor the training process and uh, resource usage, stuff like that. So, and there are some, some internal resource management. So we have a resource pool, which every job runs on a resource pool, and we have a queuing strategy that, you know, after you use all the resources in the pool, you will be queued up in the, in the waiting queue, and you won't get a failure every time you start, you're trying to start a new TensorFlow job, but you don't have enough resources in the queue. So, and here is, um, you know, our company architecture. We have, we, we have, we, we support different cloud providers and we have the infrastructure we provide um, TensorFlow as a service and we also provide uh, AI solutions. So that's it. And we have some Facebook and Twitter links. But if you have WeChat, that will be better because you have more resource. <laughs> then that's it. Thank you so much.